Uh, wonderful singing this morning. Uh, I love the last part of that last song we just sang. It's like everyone found their southern side to sing the last part, so it was great. I feel like, it, I feel like I'm at home now. So um, anyways, really enjoyed that. Have you ever went somewhere and you left something behind? Uh, recently, I asked my parents that question, and I said, Hey, Mom, have you ever been somewhere and left something behind? And she said, Yeah, your dad left a pillow behind on vacation last year. And I looked at Dad and said, Hey, Dad, have you ever been somewhere and left something behind? He said, Yeah, I left my pillow behind on vacation last year. <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot recently. I was recently traveling, and... I went to a, a hotel, and Haley, you know, she helped me prepare my nice little cosmetics bag. It had my shampoo and conditioner and toothbrush and all this kind of stuff. And I got there, and it was late. And uh, I went to get ready for bed, and it's like, man, I left that bag in Tennessee. <laughs> and um, I went to the front counter, and I asked for some dental floss, and they said, what's floss? Like, well, do you not floss here in Mississippi? <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Uh, but anyways, I got a, a toothbrush and some toothpaste, and it was like $7 for this little toothbrush and toothpaste. And I was like, man, this really costs a lot here, evidently, to brush your teeth. Um, and I went back to the room, and they only had, you know, the, the, sh- the, the hotel shampoo and conditioner. And it's so funny because when you put it on your hand, it's just like this little blob, and you put it in your hair and try to smear it, and it just sticks in one spot. Uh, so you just wash right here of your head. But uh, nevertheless, you know, when you go somewhere and you leave something behind, most of the time it costs you something. And this morning I want us to think about that in a, in a spiritual sense that many of us, we've left our nets behind. I like to fish, so this makes sense to me. Um, We've, we've left our old lifestyle, we've left our old relationships, our old way of thinking, our old, just everything all combined. But the challenge we face is, many of us have kept our nets in the garage. We keep them nearby. We keep them where they still have some influence and impact on us from time to time. Now this morning, there's a lot that could be said about this, but I want us to begin by saying this. A system produces what is designed to produce. Now, you say, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, that's a southern thing. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> that's exactly how we say it, right? Um, you know, what, what are you talking about? A system produces what it's designed to produce. What I mean by this is when you go in the mirror and you look at yourself, um, and you say, wow, I'm this. Hopefully it's a good thing most of the time. But I, I'm this, physically and spiritually. Maybe not so much physically because you can't help your genes. <laughs> some of you maybe had attractive parents and some of you, well, <laughs> you're out of luck. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, spiritually at least, when you go and you say, wow, look at me. Well, you've created yourself to be the way that you are. Because when God made you and He made me, He made us... Uh, much like, let's see if I can do this with the technology. Right, it's like this right here. Right? There, there's no defect. There's no image. There's no, there, it's just blank, right? He made us to be good. There was no, nothing inherently bad about us. Now let's hope I can get this back up. There we go. A system produces what it's designed to produce. What I'm saying is this. This morning when you look at your life and you look at the way things are, it's your own fault if you don't like what you see. It's your own fault if you don't like what you see. Now the challenge we've talked about in Bible class, and we're going to talk about again now, is that we have been justified in an instant. We've been baptized. We come up. We're so excited. You know, I can always remember this guy named Matthias. He came up and he was literally fist pumping whenever he got after he was baptized. He was so excited. Justified in an instant. But sanctified over a lifetime. We find this in Romans chapter 12. And we're familiar with this passage, but this week I've been really studying this on a deeper level. And um, The first thing I find interesting in Romans 12.1 is Paul, this word that he uses is like a a great summoning or a great urging. And he says, therefore I urge you, brothers, 
by the mercies of God. So he encourages us by God's love to love God. That's interesting to think about. To present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual uh, service of worship. And notice this word, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, picture God this way. You know, most of the time when we think about God, I don't know if you're like me, I think about an old man with a big beard and he's just got all this wisdom and he sits, you know, very straight in a chair and like he's just, I don't know, kind of like a grandpa. Um, that's probably not a very accurate picture of God. But I do find it interesting that twice in this passage, um, it talks about being pleasing to God and it talks about the will of God. And I want you to think about God as a parent. And, um, <laughs> wow, all the times that I displeased my parents. I think the first thing that always comes to my mind is when me and my brother, we were, we were playing dodgeball in the house after my parents said not to do that. You know, that's never a good idea. And um, I threw the ball and it broke the window. And I remembered that for several days afterwards. I displeased my parents. But to think about God as a parent and one who, when we make decisions, that His demeanor changes based on what we do. That God is literally upset when I make a mistake when I commit sin. I don't know that we picture God that way, but for God to have a will and for Him to be pleased also, also means that He can be displeased, which means His demeanor can change. It's a very interesting idea to consider. Now, there's also this idea of conformed and transformed, and I'm not going to get into all the, the details of it, but it's interesting because it's in the middle uh, in, in the, the middle, the mood and the tense and all this stuff in Greek, and I know you don't care about that. But what's important about it is this. What he's saying is, with this word conformed and transformed, is this. You cannot help what happens to you in life a lot of times. A lot of things that happen in life, they happen, and you have no control over them. But what he is saying is, you do have control over how you respond to those things. Do you see the difference? You can't control what happens to you. A lot of times. It's out of your power. But you can control the way that you respond to what happens to you. Now, with that in mind, I want you to go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And if you haven't read the book of Titus in a while, you need to. It's one of my favorites. Titus chapter 3. And there's several things here that I find interesting. And one of them is the bath of, uh, the bath of rebirth, is what it literally says. Um, but Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. We also once were foolish ourselves. Now, every time I think about foolish people, I think about Walmart for some reason, you know, uh, and people walking around in pajamas. Hopefully you're not that kind of person where you go to Walmart in your pajamas and just hang out with your hair all <laughs> whacked up. But nevertheless, um, that's what goes to my mind. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Now, let's think about, and, and I don't like talking about this because it's a very terrible point in American history, but slavery. A slave was consumed with the activities that the master assigned, right? It didn't have a choice and say, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't think I want to do that. Kids nowadays do that. You know, I never thought about doing that as a child. You don't, you don't tell my mom or dad that. Uh, that means you're going to remember it for a few days afterwards. Um, but now, kids, well, I don't want to do that. And they don't have to do it. Um, but when we think about slavery and being enslaved to these various lusts, literally, he's saying you were consumed by this. Everything you did in life. Now, we don't think about it. We think about good people who haven't been baptized yet, but they're still good people. That's not what he says. He says you, you are enslaved, you are consumed by this lifestyle, even though you don't realize it. Spending our life in malice, in envy, hateful, hating one another. That sounds like a lot of congregations of the Lord's people, unfortunately. Verse 4, When the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appear. This is a beautiful word. Uh, this love for mankind is all together. It's, it's a very unique, it, it's a brotherly love that God loves us as His own family. He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Literally, it's the bath of rebirth. That's an accurate translation. The bath of rebirth. Just as you are, uh, I don't, you know, people don't take baths now. But 
That's the idea, that you are consumed with this, this rebirth. Everything before, you were consumed with this old lifestyle, enslaved to the lust. And notice it's not just lust, it's various kinds. It's a manifold thing of lust. It's a bunch of different things that you're consumed with, not just one little area like we think. Because oftentimes we think, well, I only have one bad area. It's kind of like people say, well, when they're taking a picture, this is my bad side, so I have to stand on this side. I'm sure Rhonda understands that. Uh, you know, but it's not like that spiritually. It's not just one bad side. We're actually, uh, there, there's many things that we struggle with according to this passage. And this bath of rebirth. And that's what I want us to think about as we think about this lesson and this slide behind us. As Christians, we have left our old nets, but we haven't forgotten about them. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle to forget things. I can remember the first sermon that I preach, and some of you are thinking, well, man, you probably haven't preached many after that, after hearing you talk. Um, but the first sermon that I preached, and there was like, I don't know, six or seven old ladies at this congregation, and that was about it. Uh, and when one of them went to the restroom, you know, like four of them would go to help, so you're preaching to like two people. <laughs> it's just really interesting. And I can remember some of the comments that they <laughs> said to me after my my sermons, and I will never forget them, and it's not in a good way, unfortunately. I can remember the first time that I tried to get up and lead a song. I will never forget that because of the criticism that I received. So now, if you have a singing Sunday, I'm probably going to pass on that and let you uh, lead singing instead of me. Um, but there are some things in life that it's like you can never forget, and there are other things in life that you can never remember. It's kind of like for the potluck, if you're supposed to bring something and you get here, you're like, man, I forgot the pasta. Or I forgot the tea. I think Dan forgot some tea this morning or something. Um, anyways, you know, there's some things in life that just stick with us and other things that don't. And unfortunately, our previous lifestyles, our previous uh, way of living tends to stick with us. So this morning, our first point. Before I do that, I want to talk about a poem. Because I said I'm sentimental, so I'm going to do that. I had an English teacher, and uh, to be honest, she was kind of mean. Most English teachers are. Uh, and this was the poem from a guy named John Dunn or something like that. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, part of the main. Now, I skipped a lot because I don't like poetry that much. Uh, any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. The challenge we face is when I decide to go back fishing, I decide to go back to the old ways, I'm not only influencing myself, but most of the time I'm influencing someone else as well. Let me explain it like this. Can you imagine what the world would be like if everyone had the same influence? I think influence is one of the greatest blessings that God has given us. Now let me explain what I mean by that. You know, earlier we talked about the Walmart people. Can you imagine if they had the same influence as some of you? It would be a scary place. <laughs> Our government would go bankrupt very quick. Influence is beautiful. And this morning, every person that is sitting in this auditorium has influence. Now, I don't know how much influence, but you have influence over someone in some way. And when you make a decision, and this is so simple, when you make a decision, it's going to impact the way other people live their lives. Now keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that at the very end. Our first point from Matthew chapter 4. Leave your nets. Doesn't matter if you're fishing, doesn't matter how full your nets are, doesn't matter how empty your nets are, but you need to leave your nets. Matthew chapter 4. And look at uh, verse 18 with me. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, now, when I think about the Sea of Galilee, I, I, I'm kind of plagued. I'm like, huh, what's this like? So I began to do a little bit of research. In the middle, it's 141 foot deep, it's 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. Pretty big sea. It's not like the pond in Clint's backyard, but that's kind of the way I've always pictured it. 
It was like Jesus in a boat. <laughs> you know, like two steps, Peter's on the land. <laughs> Not quite that way. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now notice, these people are literally in the act of fishing. Okay, they are literally like casting their nets, throwing their nets. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I remember the time that my father and I, uh, he bought a new cast net. And he was so excited, and he was testing it out, and he was like, we need to go to the local creek. And I'm going to throw it in, and as soon as I throw it, you go ahead and pull the string uh, so it doesn't get caught on any rocks. Well, I was looking over here to the right, and he threw the net, and, and I forgot to pull the string, and he threw it right around a big rock. And I pulled the string right when it hit the rock, and obviously it tore holes all in his net. And I can remember he took dental floss later that night and was piecing together his net. And I can imagine that's kind of what this, this picture here is talking about. These people are casting their nets, they're fixing their nets, uh, and they have a lot going on. They're literally in the act of fishing. And notice the text says they were fishermen. Notice it doesn't say they were fishing. They were fishermen. Now, let me explain the difference. This is a noun. You say, well, man, you really like English. You really like parts of speech. No. But what the text is saying is this was who they were. It doesn't just describe them. It defined them. Because you can describe me as so many different things, but there's very few things that actually define me. Right? You can describe me as eating potluck in a few minutes. Looking forward to that. You can describe me as preaching right now. But those things, eating potluck hopefully doesn't define me as a person. As, you know, for maybe some of us it does, but uh, hopefully not. But there's a difference. And, and, and this idea that they were fishermen, actually it tells us a lot about these people. They were engaged in their career. And he said to them, now notice this, this is really humorous. Follow me. Can you imagine... Let's make it a little more practical. You get all, you, you know, you're at the, at the, at the airport and um, someone's supposed to pick you up. And instead, this guy just pulls up and he says, come on, get in. I'll carry you for a ride. <laughs> and we tell our kids to run from people like that. You know, you don't just follow someone if you don't know anything about them. And Jesus comes along and says, yeah, follow me. I want to make you fishers of men. And they say, okay. <laughs> you know, I just can't imagine what that's like. Verse 20, it's a key word here, immediately. Now, many of us don't understand this word, um, especially kids, you know, like, you need to get up and take the trash out right now. Then they keep playing their video game for like 30 minutes. They don't understand the word immediately or you need to immediately get to work. Okay, I'll get there, you know, a few minutes. But these people literally like, as soon as he said, follow me, they got up and they did this. Now, notice this, verse 20. They left their nets. What, what would that be symbolic of? They left their career. They left their lifestyle. And they followed Him. Now, Jesus wasn't satisfied with just two followers, right? He wanted a, a full train, I guess. So in verse 21, the text says, Going on from there, He saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father, Mending their nets. They had that dental floss out. They were fixing their nets. Now, let's make a practical point here. Some of you right now are trying to mend your nets. You're trying to figure things out on your own. You're trying to uh, figure out a better way. And um, what we're going to see is Jesus is the only true mend. So you can keep trying to mend and mend and mend, but it's never going to work. It's kind of like that net with the floss. The next time you go, there's a real weak spot right there. Right, So the floss is going to break time and time again. And the same is true spiritually. Now going on. They were mending their nets and He called them. Verse 22, notice this word again. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Him. Three things we see here. Number one, when these people left their nets, they left their faith. They weren't followers of Christ before. They left their faith. Number two, they left their family. I want to talk about that for, for a second. Actually, for more than a second, but you get the idea. Family. Some of us really struggle with this concept because some of our family members were not members of the church. 
Um, I didn't grow up in the church. I was actually privileged to baptize my mother and father. It was a wonderful thing. And I can remember when I was baptized, when my mother and father was baptized, that we felt like we were condemning our family members in some ways. That's not true. Because I promise you this, you read Scripture, you read Luke specifically, your family members right now are begging you to leave your nets. I promise you that. Now that doesn't make it any easier to think about my family members that are not, they don't have hope. It doesn't make it any easier, but I'm not going to let that be a barrier for my obedience to God. The third thing these people left was their career. They left everything they knew to follow a man who simply said, follow me. We don't find him going in this long discourse about doctrine and this long discourse about all these things. Those things are important. But when Jesus says, follow me, and it's a command, he knows that you have free will, but he still expects you to do this and not make excuses. And these men didn't. So, we need to leave our nets, whether they're empty or whether they are full. The second thing in Matthew chapter 8, even after you leave your nets, there is going to be reminders of your nets. Even after you've been a Christian for a long time, challenges present themselves. Matthew chapter 8 Beginning in verse 18, and I love this because it pictures Jesus is sleeping. I always joke and say he was a lot like some of you who'd sleep through a good sermon. Um, but nevertheless, it seems like Jesus had a sleeping problem sometimes. Um, I mean, he just, he's pictured as sleeping a lot. Uh, so I guess that means God values rest, which is an important lesson for some of us. But nevertheless, Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, Jesus saw a crowd around him, and he says, Go away, more or less. Um, verse 19, the scribe comes and says, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, Congratulations, well done, my friend. <laughs> Notice what he says. Yeah, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, Follow me. Allow the dead to bury their own dead. I mean, he was pretty serious when it came to this follow me idea. He didn't just joke around about it. Uh, it wasn't, you know, like half-hearted like some of us are. He was pretty serious. Now, verse 23, he got into the boat. I just picture what that's like. Jesus getting into your boat. Or Jesus riding in the car with you. What would you ask him? What would you talk about? Now, text goes on. His disciples followed him. Now, let me get this right. Jesus is getting in the boat with fishermen, and he gets in the boat first. Now, that's typically not the way it works. Notice, they followed him to get into the boat, but this is what they did for a living. What can we learn from that? Even when we think we have things figured out, we still need to let Jesus lead the way and follow him. Now, we go on. Verse 24, Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. And they didn't have weather channels, unfortunately. So The boat was being covered with the waves. Can you picture what this was like? Have you ever been in a boat and there's literally water coming over the side? It's a very terrifying thing. And the text says, Jesus himself was asleep. I just picture Jesus laying down in this tiny little boat and there's water like pouring over his head and he's still sleeping. And he wakes up, he's like, what's going on, man? <laughs> what, are, what, what are you complaining about? <laughs> he could sleep through anything. Verse 25, they came to him. You know, it's very interesting because it's like, how big is this boat? You know, they come to him. You know, I just picture it as like, he's just laying here and you like tap him on the head. Wake up, man. You know, there's water coming over. They come to him and they woke him. Now, 
When I read this, I just think about all the times that someone has woke me up and all the bad ways that people have done that. And I imagine this was a really terrible way to be woken up. Saying, save us, Lord. We are dying. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't it? There is so much truth in that, that statement. We are dying. Not only physically, but spiritually. Now, remember, you may wonder, well, how, how does this connect where there's going to be reminders of your nets? Well, these men were fishermen. They knew what to do. They, knew, they understood the culture of a boat, the culture of fishing, the culture of being on the water. And I imagine every time they were in the boat with Jesus, there was that reminder of their old ways, their old life. Verse 26, He said to them, Why are you afraid? In other words, He looks at them and says, What's wrong with you? And I just, I can imagine, you know, I don't know if you'd talk back to Jesus, but I can imagine them looking and saying, What's wrong with you? There's water coming over the side of the boat. Are you not afraid? And He says, You men of little faith, you don't understand. Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. Notice 27. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. What can we learn? Well, this is what we can learn right here. Right now, or sometime in the near future, Satan is going to use opportunities to try to get us to go back. He always does. He's good at that. And he's going to remind us of things that are difficult for us to endure, difficult for us to understand, difficult for us to accept. Maybe it's a bad relationship. Maybe uh, it's a bad marriage. Maybe you struggle with self-control or depression or anger. I don't know what you struggle with, but we all have our nets. We all struggle with something. Even though we can put our suits on and look really good on Sunday, we struggle with something. And that's what Satan is going to use against us. Leave your nets. Don't keep them in the garage because the closer you keep them, the easier it is for Satan to use them against us. Finally, because I know some of you are like looking at the time, you're like, Man, this guy, he's going on. He's got one more point left. We've already been 30 minutes, so doing the math. We'll get done in time. John chapter 21, where our scripture reading came from this morning. It's a wonderful text. John 21. Now, I want to encourage you this afternoon to read John chapter 20. It's, it's so much fun because you see Thomas and he's not there the first time that Jesus appears and he's like, I missed out. You know, Jesus, how could you do this? And then Jesus says, okay, Thomas, you can feel, feel the scars. And then in John 21, you know, you think they, they would understand everything. They saw Jesus, you know, they, 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 they should know better now. And in John 21, beginning in uh, verse 1, after these things, and you know, let me make a side note. People always say the purpose statement of John is found in John 20, 30, and 31. That's true. But if you want to understand what that means, read John 21. Because everyone kind of like just cuts off John 21 and it's really sad. But nevertheless, after these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, the same sea that we've been talking about this whole time. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel, sons of Zebedee, these two brothers, all these people were together. And they're sitting around and they're talking a lot like men do. And I can just imagine, you know, they're sitting there, you know, What's Jesus going to do? What's He going to make us do? Is He going to... And all this stuff. And Peter looks up and he says, Hey, I'm going fishing. That's pretty innocent, isn't it? He just wants to go fishing. just wants to catch a few fish. Not quite that innocent. And when many of us think about our life and we think about leaving our nets, oftentimes we go back fishing and we say, Well, you know, it's just one day. It's just... One time. It's not going to hurt anything because I'll just ask for forgiveness and everything will be all right again. It's not that innocent. And what we're going to find is they don't catch anything. 
And that's not on accident. When you experience what God has to offer and you go back fishing, you're going to catch nothing every time. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, notice this, we will come with you. That is so sad. Let me explain why. Because Peter, I don't know that he understood the influence that he had. And this morning, the most dangerous thing, but also one of the greatest blessings that we have is influence. And some of you don't understand the influence you have. When you make good decisions, you influence people for good. But unfortunately, most of us don't think about the influence we have when we do bad things. And we set a terrible example and cause other people to stumble. And I'm convinced that one of the most terrible things that's ever going to happen to a man or woman is stand before God and God bring up a situation where you were a stumbling block for another person. And that's exactly what Peter did here whether he intended to or not. Because they said, we will come with you. The text goes on. They went and they got into the boat that night and they caught nothing. Again, you can go back fishing, but you're never going to catch anything. Now, if you want some more humor, you can look at verse 7. And I think the Bible is meant to be read this way, that we can put ourselves in these situations. Uh, basically, Jesus comes and, and Peter like jumps in the water and or he jumps into the sea and starts acting crazy. Verse 7 says he literally threw himself into the sea. Uh, but nevertheless, they go on. Jesus lets them catch, uh, what, 153 fish here in verse 11. But I want to conclude the lesson today. Don't, get, don't put your Bibles up yet. We're not quite done. With verses 15 through 17. So Peter goes back fishing and he convinces these other people to go back fishing with him. What does Jesus say and what does Jesus do? How does He respond to that? Well, He looks at Peter three times and asks a question. Do you love me? Hmm. This morning, Jesus is asking us through the Bible, do we love Him? We have to leave our nets. Unfortunately, there's going to be reminders of our nets. And I think the big point for most of us is this. Don't go back fishing after you've seen the resurrected king. Don't go back fishing. I love to fish, but spiritually, don't go back fishing. This is the last thing I want to leave you this morning right here. Does being a fisher of men describe you or does it define you? If it describes you, it means you do it every now and then. If it defines you, it means it's who you are. It's your identity. So this morning, we're about to sing a, a song. Some of us need to leave our faith. Some need to perhaps leave a career. But most of us, what holds us back is family, unfortunately. Others of us just need to get rid of some nets in our garage. So as we sing this song in a second, I want, I, want, I want to encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, there's nothing I can say that no one else has said. Jesus said it himself. You know, nothing I say is going to convince you. You need to do it. It's that simple. But for most of us, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of just trying to be a Christian, trying to live right. So, I'll leave you with this. Does being a fisher of man describe you or does it define you? If heaven need you come as we stand, as we sing.